Um, so welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to welcome Helen Ziller, uh, who was um, who currently serves as the Federal Council Chairperson of the Democratic Alliance, uh, the two-term Premier of Western Cape, um, and also served as the Federal Leader of the Democratic Alliance from 2007 to 2015, and as Mayor of Cape Town from 2006 to 2009. So we're very I'm fortunate to have you here, and Helen, if you'd like to say a few words. <coughs> Thank you, Sam. It's good to be with you and Freddie, and thanks for asking me. Hi, everybody. It's fun to be doing this kind of thing. I have never given a talk or seminar like this before online, so there's always a first for everything. I'm sure you're very used to it. I thought I might say something a little bit about liberalism in a developing country at the time of COVID, which is a multiple challenge. Liberalism trying to find roots in Africa is enough of a challenge of its own. But at a time of COVID, it is quite an enormous challenge because when people are faced with an overwhelming fear, they are much more inclined to embrace authoritarianism and the strong leader and much more inclined to accept authoritarian regulations and rules that they might otherwise not have been quite so easily prepared to accept. Now, that is a problem for us because quite unlike Britain, we haven't got the institutions and the culture of liberalism built into our DNA. What do I mean by this? In Britain, you completely take for granted concepts such as a multi-party democracy where government can change hands, in an election. You completely take for granted to the point that you don't even have to have a written constitution, concepts such as the independence of the judiciary, the rule of law, separation of powers, the accountability of the executive, the role of parliament. So all of these things are built into your political architecture and into your culture, your DNA, which is not the case in our country. Yes, we've been a democracy since 1994, but it takes much, much longer to become a consolidated democracy. And so, of course, at a time of crisis, when government assumes enormous powers, as our government has now assumed through the State of Disaster or the Disaster Management Act, because the State of Disaster is governed by the Disaster Management Act, it creates a very new challenge for liberals. And those of us liberals in politics face this particular challenge. The entire country is rallying behind a strong leader or perceived strong leader in Cyril Ramaphosa. And people think that you're quibbling or being petty or looking at technical details when you start arguing that rights matter and that accountability matters. Now, of course, we have never had occasion to exercise the State of Disaster Act before. This is the first time. It's an act that dates from 2002. And it is a strikingly illiberal piece of legislation that we now believe is unconstitutional. And to be quite frank, I wonder how it could have got through without a huge amount of resistance from the Democratic Alliance back in 2002 because some of the most fundamental constitutional safeguards are not there. You'll remember that under apartheid, or you wouldn't remember because all of you are much too young, but under apartheid, we had successive states of emergency, which gave huge concentrated powers to the state president and to the executive. And of course, our democratic government didn't want to call it the State of Emergency Act, although it remains on our statute book, that ghastly piece of legislation, there is a Disaster Management Act. And that is supposed to be a lesser state of emergency than the State of Emergency Act. But of course, it is nothing of the kind. Even the State of Emergency Act has got checks and balances and requires parliamentary oversight, requires the emergency declaration to be tabled in parliament within three weeks. And if the emergency is going to be extended, has to go back for the support of the whole house to the tune of 60% of its members. 
So there's provision for answers to parliamentary questions, provision for oversight, and all of the things that a legislature is obliged to do over an executive. The state of disaster has none of that. It delegates all power to the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, who in our case happens to be Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma, the former wife of our former president, who managed with a group of his cronies to loot the state while he was president for nine years. And his ex-wife, who he was punting to be the next president, is in fact the Minister of Cooperative Government and Traditional Affairs. So suddenly she holds all the disaster management powers and she has the power to delegate those powers to a small group of a national command council, which is a small secretive group of cabinet ministers who are completely unaccountable and who take decisions without having to answer questions in parliament. We have driven the need for accountability so much that in eventually, and I'm delighted to say, we have some parliamentary standing committees working online now, but we are also challenging in court and requesting leave to approach the constitutional court directly to declare the state of disaster legislation, the Disaster Management Act, unconstitutional, primarily on the basis of the principle of separation of powers. Because what the act effectively allows is for the executive to create a small legislative arm within it. And they already have to date produced 40 different sets of regulations amounting to hundreds of pages of new laws, which fundamentally impinge on our most basic rights and freedoms and turn them into favors of the government, which of course is anathema to any liberal. And so we've sought direct access to the constitutional court to challenge the very constitutionality of the Disaster Management Act and to ask the court to read into that act the basic safeguards and at least those that are currently in the State of Emergency Act. So it's been a very, very challenging time for us and a very challenging time in that the public mood rallies behind a strong leader. And ironically, although we've got such high rates of unemployment and they're going to be much, much higher when we come out of a state of disaster, although the economy is being decimated, although people's freedoms have been fundamentally curtailed, ANC support does grow very strongly at a time like this. And it takes all the energy, effort, and focus that we can possibly muster to start upholding these core values of our constitution and explaining why they are so important. We've got several other challenges to various regulations imposed under the Disaster Management Act, such as, for example, the evening curfew. Even under level five of the lockdown, we didn't have a curfew. And we are saying that has got nothing to do with the risk of transmission. It has everything to do with other factors and we don't want to support that kind of impingement on people's rights to freedom of movement and association. And we are very much opposing the tiny little exercise window people are allowed every day. We're also strongly opposing, and this may be something that you'd like to discuss, the imposition of broad-based black economic empowerment criteria on applications for relief to small businesses during this particular period. So there are many things that we are challenging, but at the root of it, it's the constitutionality of the Disaster Management Act because it fundamentally undermines the constitutional principle of separation of powers. Initially, we did support the hard lockdown for one simple reason. We didn't have any data. We didn't have the information that we needed. And we also needed time to gear up to the extent possible, our health system and our public health system is not in the best of conditions. We had to ramp that up for the avalanche that we feared would come and we had to flatten the curve in doing so. So our argument was we would support the first three week, weeks of the hard lockdown in order to flatten the curve and raise the bar, raise the line of the state of readiness of our health system. 
that was a kind of social contract, if you like, behind us supporting hard lockdown. But we've, uh, in, we've opposed quite strongly the extension of the lockdown. And now we're arguing very strongly for reopening the economy with safety protocols established that will be determined by each sector of the economy themselves and monitored by employees, employers, and each other to ensure that we can get this economy growing again, because you cannot have a debate between lives and livelihoods in South Africa. Before this lockdown started, we had 10 million people unemployed. And the worst estimates are that we're going to have another 7 million people unemployed. 17 million people unemployed out of a population of 55 million, and that includes very old people, beyond employment age of very young people, which is the very vast bulk of our population. So the 17 million unemployed is way beyond what the tax base, which is 7 million registered personal taxpayers, can support. So that is the crisis that we're moving into. And many actuaries have projected that deaths from the lockdown will rapidly overtake deaths from the disease. So it's a very fine tightrope that we have to walk as liberals in this time. But we believe now that we must focus on getting the economy growing, because if people don't work, they don't eat. We haven't got the tax base to support people for an extended period of time. And we're going to crucially have to look at livelihoods to keep people alive. A big challenge for liberals, a big challenge for liberalism, I think 95% of South Africa's population wouldn't know what you were talking about when you say we have to fight for the separation of powers. We know how important that is, and some people do, but for the others, they're saying, why are you fighting with the government? Surely you should be working with the government at this stage. So those are some of the things we're dealing with, and I wanted to be brief because you gave me 10 minutes, and I'm just on 10 minutes now, and I think we'll go back to the questions if that's okay. That's incredibly interesting. So you mentioned that the DA is um, taking the government to court um, on the basis that their actions, that the lockdown is unconstitutional. Uh, what would you sort of suggest as an, as an alternative to what they're doing? What would a, a DA government do if faced by a similar sort of crisis? We were the first proponents of what we call the smart lockdown. And everything in the smart lockdown was premised on how do we minimize the transmission risk. And pretty soon in the curve, we understood what the key transmission risks were and that there were several factors, social distancing, mask wearing, sanitizing, and screening that were quite good preventers of transmission. So we basically said three weeks for hard lockdown to massively prepare the health system with personal protective equipment, with additional ventilators, with additional ICU beds and high care beds. We turned, for example, where we govern in the Western Cape, the huge convention center into an 800 bed high care hospital. We had a whole number of field hospitals for initial testing and triaging and all of that. So the first stage of the smart lockdown was hard lockdown for three weeks. The second stage was continue lockdown for high risk individuals, because that emerged pretty early on, that comorbidities are the real risk and old age is the real risk. And we have many people with comorbidities, although our population is massively young, the average age of somebody in sub-Saharan Africa is 19 years old, whereas in Britain it's 45 or something like that. So you can see how we've got a preponderance of very young people and young people are not at risk. And people over the age of 55, but particularly 60 with comorbidities, diabetes, high blood pressure, untreated HIV and AIDS, so with a low CD4 count, tuberculosis, those are the people who are at great risk. And so the second stage was to maintain hard lockdown where possible for people of high risk, and to ensure where lockdown is not possible, which it isn't in many of our highly overcrowded areas, for the government specifically to focus on high-risk individuals and move them out to safe places, to places where they could lock down safely, 
to um, guest houses, to hotels, to wherever they needed to be, if they fitted the high risk profile. But then to get back to work to the extent that every industry could be ready with the basic protocols. Initially, we had a protocol per industry. We have now dropped that and said this has to be self monitored and self regulated because it's very clear and it's not very difficult to determine what the protocols are social distancing, sanitizing, mask wearing, screening, and wherever possible, if those criteria can be applied, which would ob obviously mean in many cases fewer staff members, uh, pacing customers out, having proper queuing systems, etc., business should, should be able to get back to work because the crisis here is that people are losing their jobs and the economy that was already so, so fragile just cannot take any more shocks. We were already um, on a ventilator in our economy before COVID-19 and this shock we just could not abide. The one thing that we've agreed should not continue are mass gatherings of any kind. So theatres, church services, large funerals, huge weddings, that kind of thing are a definite no-no and restaurants and other places where people gather should use takeout services primarily rather than anything else. So that is basically our proposal. We are refining the final proposal. We have been very, very opposed to arbitrary random manipulation of certain economic sectors for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with preventing transmission. But apart from that, we are saying open this economy because the more people are going to die from the lockdown. That does not mean to say that we are oblivious to the risk. And it is a high risk. And no politician likes to talk about death. And it's a very stupid thing to do. But in this case, we must remember that there isn't any choice before us that gives zero death. There's no such choice. Now, it's also a fact that 400,000 people in South Africa die of natural causes every year. And 22,000 of those die of flu. And almost 60,000 of those die of tuberculosis. Now, at the very high estimate, and some people say it's far too exaggerated, the highest estimate is that we could lose 45 thousand people by November. Now that is a huge amount and people say how can you dare propose opening the economy in those circumstances. So far we've had 369 deaths. I don't think that the pro projection will reach anything like 45,000. But the bottom line is that uh, we are going to have to make some very tough choices. I also believe that kids should go back to school because children are at very minimal risk but that's also highly controversial in the South African context. And apparently children don't easily transmit to adults. So all of these are major debates and we're having them, but we're putting in our proposals and those are our proposals roughly. Lewis. Okay, so you mentioned the state of disaster legislation. Yes. And also the fact it's being run through cooperative governance and traditional affairs. Correct. To my understanding, the last time South Africa had significant emergency powers legislation was the Internal Security Act. Correct. In the 80s and 90s. Correct. Now, those were run through justice and law and order. Correct. So based on that principle, the state of disaster should be run by Lamalola and Jelle. It, can you give a reason? Do you, do you think it? What do you think it says about how South Af how the South African government is functioning that it's being administered by, well, Zuma and Cooperative Affairs rather than Justice? Or well, I think the reason is that it is a national function that when you have a state of disaster, you have to have our three spheres of government. They're not tiers of government but they're independent and mutually in interdependent spheres of government. So you have national, provincial, and local. 
And in a state of disaster, you have to have a lot of interaction between those three spheres of government because they all have original powers in the constitution. So when we have a local disaster, for example, we had terrible fires in Nisna, that was a local disaster. It still goes under the portfolio of cooperative governance from the local level right through to the national level so that there can be the cooperation, we can get the firefighters from the rest of the country, we can get firefighters and support from national, we can get money from national, etc. When there's a drought, it can be a provincial disaster in which the same cooperative elements happen. So it's the cooperative governance between three spheres of government that determines that that is the ministry that runs state of disaster and states of you know, crisis like that. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Um, could you talk about potentially going back in time, uh, your your role in exposing the cover up of the Biko murder? Yes, well, I was a very young journalist back in 1977. I haven't been long out of university. I think my final year of my degree was 1974. So it was 1977. I was three years out of university and I was a young bright-eyed, bushy-tailed political journalist on a liberal newspaper called the Rand Daily Mail. And I was very keen on building up my career as a journalist. And I had some good advantages that perhaps other journalists didn't have. I was, um, I, I was well, multilingualism is absolutely normal in South Africa. It's not an unusual thing. So almost all the journalists were multilingual. But I also had some other things and I'd done well on the introductory courses and that. So I was still a very young journalist, just out of the cadet course. And Steve Biko was arrested. Now he was a, a, a very high profile black consciousness activist. So that was in the black consciousness tradition rather than the Congress tradition of the ANC. And Steve Biko really stood strongly against the non-racial tradition as it had evolved through the Congress movement and others. And his famous phrase was black man, you are on your own. And he mobilized the black people's convention and uh, the black community programs and all of those major activities and was mobilizing, especially on the Eastern seaboard in the Eastern Cape. He was a, significant thorn in the government's flesh. He had a strong support base across university campuses, a young, very dynamic and very good looking guy, which didn't stand him in bad stead at all in the context of the politics of the time. And he managed to get this huge following and police saw him as a problem and arrested him under the Internal Security Act. And they put him into the warmer police station and a week later they announced that he had died of a hunger strike, which was frankly anatomically impossible. Even if he had been drinking too much water or liquids, he could not have died of a hunger strike within a week. So our editor says this is impossible and he had to get somebody to do the assignment. And he asked me, which was a, an incredible privilege. I was daunted by the, the responsibility of it, to be quite frank, because it was a daunting responsibility. I knew that, you know, uncovering the truth really depended on us because we were the only liberal newspaper around and we were the only one that would risk the censorship laws at the time and the state security legislation at the time to go after the story because it was clearly something that would take us across many barriers. Now, um, my editor gave me an enormous amount of support, Alistair Sparks, and one thing that I've learned is that any young journalist is only as good as their editor. You know, when you're a young person going into the world of look, work, look for the right boss. Believe me, look for the right boss. Often your boss is, is more important than the, the specific job you get because your boss determines whether you get the opportunities, whether you get the breaks. Obviously, your attitude is hugely important too, but my editor just gave me this responsibility and it was an enormous responsibility which weighed very heavily on me. Anyway, after some while of researching this issue, Dr. Jonathan Gluckman, 
who was the pathologist, the private pathologist, said he would speak to us. And he gave us, on the commitment of complete secrecy, the post-mortem report, which showed blood in the spinal fluid. And he said to us, there is only one way that people can get blood in the spinal fluid and that is through a head injury. So I can tell you that Steve Biko died of a head injury and the minister has been lying when he told you that he died of a hunger strike. So now we had the story, but we couldn't publish because we couldn't expose our source. So then we had to track down an alternative source. And so I was sent down to Port Elizabeth on the Eastern Cape, which is now known as Nelson Mandela Bay. And my job was to track down all the doctors who had seen Steve Biko at various stages in that week. There was a Dr. Lang, he was the local district surgeon. There was a Dr. Tucker. And there was a Dr. Freddie Her Kirsch, I think it was Kirsch or Hirsch. I think it was Hirsch. And Lang and Tucker were civil servants, and they were clearly uh, not prepared to speak to me. One had huge Great Danes and threatened to put his dog on me. I had to track him down on a small holding. The other slammed his office door in my face, so I realized they were covering something up. But Dr. Hirsch was a completely different kettle of fish. He was a specialist, neurologist, if I recall correctly. And I went to his house, and he asked me in, and he said, look, he wasn't allowed to speak. And I asked him to deny certain things that I put to him from what we knew from Do uh, Jonathan Gluckman, who was the other doctor. And he said, look, this is a terrible story. I really can't discuss it with you. But he told me enough. He told me enough to make me understand that we had enough of a contribution from the doctors for me to go away and be absolutely certain that Steve Biko did not die of a hunger strike because it would have been very easy for all of those doctors to have confirmed that he died of a hunger strike, that he was dehydrated and starved if that indeed had been the case. But it clearly wasn't the case. And if all they had to do was confirm what the minister had said, there would have been no problem for them. So I went back and I said, look, I haven't got anybody telling me on the record that this was the reason, but I do have people effectively confirming that it wasn't the hunger strike. So we can run with a headline, no sign of hunger strike from the Biko doctors to cover our true source, which is then what we did. And of course there was all hell broke loose and it, it was one of the things that forced an inquest, which I was very pleased because then you can cross examine and you can get advocates for the family and all of that. So it did force an inquest and we were able to get to the truth through that. So that's the full story. And all these years later at the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, Colonel Snayman, which is the, the person who actually murdered, or one of the three people that actually murdered Steve Biko came and confessed at the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, but we pretty much fingered him and exposed him at the time. That's that's a really incredible story, actually. Um, thank you for that. Um, there's one question here, which is um, one of the things you mentioned in your initial talk was um, all the the scandal that surrounded Jacob Zuma a few years ago, the Gupta affair, and um, the allegations of state capture. Um, what do you think needs to be improved, sort of structurally, in South Africa to prevent that sort of large scale corruption from occurring? Well, there are some very fundamental problems. And it's a problem in African country and until Gladstone, it was just as much of a problem in Britain. The problem of patronage. It's the problem of interlinking networks of favors, and especially where power powerful politicians are involved. It works on the basis that I'll look after you if you look after me. And the patronage network 
which militates against any form of meritocracy or fitness for purpose in any position, but works as a network of favors and mutual benefits is the biggest factor undermining Africa's political economy, the whole of Africa and many other countries. And especially because in our continent, you have a situation where we have insane borders where there are many different tribal groupings within one particular country. The notion that a tribe takes power or an ethnic group accedes to power and then controls the distribution of favors is very, very widespread. That is why I often like to say, you know, Barack Obama could have become president in America, but he could never have been president in Kenya, which is where his father came from, because of the fact that his father came from a minority tribe. And it's only the Kukuya that have ever got uh, into power in um, Kenya. So the entire notion of looking after your people, which I suppose is there across the whole of Europe, we've seen that with Brexit and everything, except Europe is or was breaking down now, but a series of tribal states and probably after COVID become much more insular and inward looking as a series of tribal states. So the patronage network is very fundamental in our context and breaking it and getting concepts like the rule of law and accountability and meritocracy in systems is unbelievably difficult. I mean, it's not for nothing that you celebrated 800 years of the Magna Carta last year. That's how long it takes to move away from these systems into a fully fledged liberal constitutional democracy. So it's hardly any surprise that we're not there. But apart from that patronage network, on top of that, we had this thing called broad-based black economic empowerment, which gave it a kind of moral fig leaf. You were doing the right thing because you were undoing the legacy of apartheid by getting black people into top positions, which was the ideal moral fig leaf to disguise this patronage network and the jobs for pals. And when Jacob Zuma was accused of corruption, he said, hold on a minute. I was just doing what the law said. I was following BBBEE. And that is why we appointed all of these people to positions. But eventually, they worked as a mutually enriching network in which the key decisions were taken outside of the state by the beneficiaries or the people who were the benefactors, I should say, of the politicians. And so it fell right in line with the ANC's National Democratic Revolution, which you might have heard very often, but which in simple terms means this. It means the party, the ANC, controls the state, and the state controls the economy. And then it works in a self-perpetuating circle. The economy or a few business people, influential business people, capture the politicians who control the state that manages the economy. And there you have the tenders and the contracts flowing around in this connected circle. Party controls the state. A particular faction in the party controls the party that controls the state, controls the economy, controls the politicians. And there you have this interlinking network claiming to be transformative, but doing the very opposite. Crony capitalism in a highly centralized manipulative state where one by one, the institutions of state get captured. So the police become captured as an extension of the ruling clique of the ruling party. The national prosecuting authority becomes the prosecutor of the ruling clique of the ruling party that controls the state. So the entire criminal justice system gets used to punish opponents of the ruling clique and to protect the criminals who are in it. The South African Revenue Service was also captured for a long period, where if anybody goes after tax dodgers who happen to be linked to this network, 
Well, the people who are going after them get thrown out. And so you get state capture. Institutions that in a liberal democracy are supposed to defend and protect the rights of individuals against the state become an extension of the ruling clique of the ruling party controlling the state to crush other people's rights and to protect certain connected individuals and to persecute others. And that's what happened in Zimbabwe. Wholesale state capture. And we in the liberal democracy believe that we have to stop that from happening. And so far, our institutions have been very robust. And our critical role has been to defend those institutions and to win power where we can. We've won power where we can, in the Western Cape, in Cape Town, in other municipalities, so that the ANC can't get a two-thirds majority, and so that we can consistently support those institutions that are meant to defend our democracy and the rule of law. And that is why we're taking all of these abuses through the Disaster Management Act, including declaring the act unconstitutional through, ju through the judicial review at the moment. I hope that makes sense. Very much so. You mentioned um, the, the problems that arise when the party is in control of the state and also um, the DA trying to win where it can, um, but potentially not going far beyond uh, Western Cape and Cape Town. Um, do you think we'll ever really see an end to ANC dominance in South Africa? And if so, what would it take? To... Yeah, absolutely we will. I mean, in 2016, we managed to put coalition governments together in Nelson Mandela Bay, which was a nice irony of history and in uh, Chwani Pretoria, which is the administrative capital, and in Johannesburg. So we beautifully broke out of the Western Cape and had coalition governments in those three major centers, as well as some smaller centers, Koha, um, you know, various other places that are, are, won't be familiar to, to you. But um, we've had some successes in governments. We've also had some failures. Running coalitions with highly divergent parties is a very difficult thing to get right. A very difficult thing to get right. Because they span the political spectrum. I mean, you, you know, you, if you want to get to power, ideally you'd like to choose your coalition partners, but you know, you have to make sure that anybody who's going to work against the ANC and create a coalition, even if we're rather disjointed ideologically, is often what you have to do. And then you have to try and implement your policy framework within that. So it's very complex. I had to do that in Cape Town with a seven party coalition, which spanned the political spectrum literally from far left to far right, from fundamentalist Christian to fundamentalist Muslim to the whole lot, six other parties. It was fun and games, I can tell you. So the, uh, so the challenge is to do that, but you know, it's a process. We're going to be coalition country for a very long time in the future, especially at local government level. We have a local government scheduled for next year, and we're hoping that we'll be in many other coalitions. We've learned a lot about coalitions. They're difficult to run. But first, the ANC will start losing power to coalitions. And there's also been another very important historical trend in South Africa. Between 1994 and 2004 were the golden years of the ANC. There you saw the gear policy, which was much maligned by the South African Congress of, by the Congress of South African Trade Unions, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, COSATU, and the South African Communist Party, believe it or not, they stood in the ruling party. And they were very critical of the redistribution through growth strategy. So gear said we have to grow so that we can redistribute. And they put every focus on growing the economy in order to facilitate redistribution. So it was a redistribution through growth policy. The left in the ANC argued that you should have growth through redistribution, although they never quite explained how that would work. And the gear policy actually, although it was very much opposed, produced, well, I think the people in jobs doubled between, two, uh, between 1994 and 2004, if I'm not mistaken. It was an extraordinary surge of jobs, which coincided with an extraordinary surge of the ANC. And in, in 2004, the ANC at one point had much more than a two-thirds majority, which was the highest they've ever had. So now, 
that we're going into what is probably going to be a depression, and this is terrible. We started out with 10 million people unemployed as we went into this 30% unemployment, which is horrific. <coughs> the worst case scenario is that it will almost double. 7 million more people unemployed, which is unthinkable. And if you look at the graph of unemployment and the fortunes of the ANC, you will always see that they track each other very closely. So I think the ANC is in, in for an enormous shock. As I say, next year is a local government election, but unless they can pull off an economic miracle, and that will require dumping BBBEE, it will require dumping all the regulatory environments that enable the state to manipulate the economy, it will require a great deal of reform and legislative reform, enabling confidence to return and investment to happen. Absent that, the ANC is at serious danger in 2024 when we go to the next national general election. Sorry about this, I'm just coughing a bit. Carry on, I'm not crying, I promise you. <laughs> Been um, talking too long. One feature of liberalism that certainly shows up here in the UK um, is a sense of internationalism. And I was wondering yeah. if you could talk about uh, the future of sort of pan-African internationalism and potentially the African Union. Where does that sit and how can that help the content of Africa, the continent of Africa even. Yeah, well, well the pan-African movement that we're currently involved in is uh, the Africa Liberal Network, which is very important. And it does a tough job, you know, trying to seed these concepts and ideas in very unfertile soil often. We also belong to Liberal International. And the DA has got DA abroad, so we tend to support very much international contact and international connections. Oh. We think the AU is an old boys club, primarily, although there are a few women in it. We think that they run an, a pan-African patronage network, unfortunately, which has done very, very little for the continent and certainly very little for what needs to be done for development and growth and for achieving the Millennium Development Goals, which we strongly support. So we think the rot that I've just described of patronage, of um, enrichment networks, et cetera, applies just as much to the African Union. We don't see much hope in the African Union. And we really believe that uh, various African states need to ensure that they are governed by the rule of law, a culture of accountability and a capable state, which only comes if you apply principles of meritocracy. Um, Hannah wanted to ask, um, how has the South African Health Service's experience with other major infectious diseases informed the response to this pandemic? Well, you know, infectious diseases are, um, are so different. The, the thing about COVID is that it's so very, very infectious. You can get it so quickly and easily. Um, HIV and AIDS, and we have a very, very high HIV and AIDS statistic as well, is largely under control from a treatment perspective, but not from a transmission perspective because people haven't changed their behavior, especially young people, young women. So the biggest problem that we find in our country is getting people to change behavior. And so transmission rates, especially to young women, are horrifically high because we tend to have a culture of multiple sexual partners intergenerationally. So older men having younger partners and often much younger partners and then multiple partners, which is called the AIDS superhighway. So although the very intensive treatment regimen that we have all over the country, the antiretroviral treatments, and in the Western Cape, we have a highly effective antiretroviral regime, which is supposed to actually curb transmissions, hasn't been very effective in that because of this challenge that we're facing of changing behavior. But AIDS, I can say, is largely under control 
from a treatment point of view, if not from a transmission point of view. And South Africa has perhaps the most comprehensive AIDS treatment program in the world. Of course, I'm always getting into a lot of trouble for saying what I'll repeat on this platform. There's an opportunity cost in health. And if adults are not changing the behavior and we are spending billions on treating diseases that people can choose not to get, or men effectively can choose not to spread, often women have no choice in the matter at all, which doubles the tragedy. But when adults do that kind of thing, then there's very little money to go around for diseases that people can't choose not to get, like kidney failure, like childhood cancer, and all of that sort of thing. So these kinds of zero-sum choices that affect behavior change is not what South Africans are particularly good at. And I keep on saying that because I don't think it's something we should duck because it's politically incorrect. Now, the lockdown has worked very well, and we've got a private health sector which is working extremely functionally. And ironically, during the initial stages of this lockdown to prevent this, uh, the, the astronomical rate of spread of COVID, the initial stages of the lockdown has seen our hospitals almost empty because other people were too scared to go into hospital for fear of contracting a virus and anything elective was postponed. And so many things weren't being tested and treated. And for a long time when all leave was canceled, the hospitals were virtually empty. Now that the Western Cape seems to be approaching the peak infection rate, our public hospitals are very, very full. But there is a lot of cooperation and mutual support between the private hospitals and the public hospitals, a lot of triaging. And as I said, we turned the convention center into an 800 bed high care hospital. And so we're going to see the high point in the Western Cape, June, July, the very high point after which we hope it will subside. But everybody's working together and currently they are doing a marvelous job. And we take our hat off to our health workers. Now, the big problem is that we've had a 100% death rate of these 369 deaths. Those who've been on ventilators have died. And that is because with this illness, your body's incapacity to absorb the oxygen does not result in the visible distress that it otherwise would if you weren't absorbing oxygen. And so by the time people get onto ventilators when the oxygen levels are very, very low, it is too late. Apparently this virus does something to your lungs that makes them spongy and makes it quite impossible to absorb oxygen if you've got other comorbidities. And so these things called oximeters become very, very important. While people aren't that sick to measure the amount of oxygen they, they are absorbing and all that kind of thing. So it's a whole new field of medicine that is being pioneered. So by the time people get into intensive care, they tend not to survive as Prime Minister Boris Johnson survived when he got into intensive care. But we are learning very quickly and now people's oxygen is being measured much earlier and we're hoping that there'll be a higher survival rate. The big problem we've got is these comorbidities. So many people are obese in South Africa and so many people have the high blood pressure and diabetes combination, which is absolutely fatal. Um, you mentioned uh, what you referred to as the, the AIDS superhighway. And I was wondering if you could comment on uh, something that is, you've been sort of controversial for around um, criminalization of sort of intentionally spreading HIV and AIDS. Yes, I've been very controversial for that. Um, but let me tell you my very simple point. And I read, I, th I think it was a case in Britain where someone transferred herpes to somebody knowingly and, uh, and got a criminal record for that. Don't look it up on the internet. I mean, there are several cases in the world. I know there was a case in Germany where a person who was aware that they were HIV positive and transmitted the virus to someone also got a, a criminal record and a sentence. So the critical thing is that when you've got the, the kind of infection rates that we have, 
I think it's incumbent on everybody to know their status. You can get a free test anywhere you like. I think it's incumbent on people to know your status and then to act accordingly. Because other people also have a right to be protected. You have a right to privacy, they have a right to be protected. There are free condoms in the Western Cape. We give out 100 million free condoms every year. Condoms are a very good AIDS prophylactic. So there's no reason why a person should not know their status. And there is no reason why people should not protect themselves. However, there are a whole lot of different cultural issues that I don't want to discuss now. And a whole range of uh, shame issues around that, obviously. And the culture of having multiple sexual partners across age barriers is a big problem because often young women don't have any choice in the matter at all. There's still a culture called okutwala in the, in the deep rural areas where women get abducted by men, young women get abducted by men in some parts of the country still as part of cultural practices. And these women can easily get infected with HIV and AIDS at the age of 14, 15, 16. And I just feel that that is a serious criminal offense. And I believe that uh, men who know their status should not be having unprotected sex with young women. And I know that people argue culture and all this kind of thing, and I accept that there are different cultures, but, you know, as liberals, we feel that your, my freedom ends when your physical safety is at great risk. And that is the case with HIV. And even though you can get onto an antiretroviral regime, it's with you for your whole life, and there's no cure, and there are side effects from antiretrovirals, which are highly unpleasant. And there's always the risk of mother-to-child transmission if you have a baby later on, and a whole range of other things. So I honestly think that in a country with our rates of transmission, if culture is standing in the way of prevention, we have to tackle those cultural practices. I'm very sorry. And I get into trouble every time I say it, but a little bit of the rule of law put on top of it actually never harmed anybody in my view. No, yeah, and you're, you're absolutely right about the, the 2011 conviction in the UK about recklessly passing on um, genital herpes. Uh, that, that was upheld by the Court of Appeal. Um, so. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so I thought I'd move on to some quick fire questions, which we always do at the end of these talks. Please so do. I'll put these three questions to you and you can answer them in any order. First is what have been your lockdown hobbies? Um, have you, you know, taken up a new sport or anything or socially distanced hobby? Um, second is do you have a favourite book? And the third, I'd like to ask you about your podcast. Uh, tea with Helen um, and how you think you know maybe to segue this to something more political how you think we can as liberals engage with a younger generation a generation who does use podcast and YouTube to uh, consume their media right well one of your guys that I completely love is Jonathan Pye I think he's totally brilliant I love him I, I love the way he sends up all the woke folk there I call them workers pocus brigade so uh and I'm definitely not one of them, although I thought Joe Swinson was a hell of a woke, I'm afraid. And, and I don't go for that because it just reinforces all the nonsense that we're trying to actually deal with here. It's a luxury that we can't afford. So uh, my lockdown hobbies, look, I have been moving the Democratic Alliance online. Now, I'm not a, a, a computer boffin, but I've been moving all our systems, processes and structures because now I'm in charge of the interface between the politics and the administration. So I've been losing, using, moving everything online. So all our caucuses are functioning online now, all our federal executive, our federal council, our shadow cabinet, all of those things have moved online, been a big, big challenge. We've just done our first mayoral selection panel online. We've just, uh, we're planning next week is going to be our manifesto workshop, 300 participants online. It's, it's a huge challenge and we want to have our electoral conference at the end of this year online. So reading up about that, ensuring that internally the party's ready, ensuring that we get good instruction leaflets out to everybody explaining what it involves and how to do it, making sure that people who haven't got devices can access 
um, ensuring that people who have never sent an email are able to participate. It's all a big challenge and it's all wonderfully exciting. And I've been working uh, very, very hard on doing that. And then we've also been doing our first town hall meetings online, which has been great. So we usually, you know, have little town hall meetings where there's a local issue and you book the local hall, you get everybody together and everyone comes and you're lucky if you get two or 300 people, hallelujah. Well, you know, we had a town hall over the big court case that we're running in Chwani, which is Pretoria. We had a town hall meeting and we had over 10,000 people viewing that town hall meeting. So we're really into a new era now. And I've been spending the whole of lockdown almost nonstop moving on to digital platforms, which has been very, very exciting indeed. Um, I tried to get my husband to learn ballroom dancing um, online, but um, you know, he's, he's got two degrees in mathematics, but when it comes to counting to three and listening to a beat, we have a bit of a challenge there. So we did, I thought I didn't want to get divorced before the end of lockdown, having been married for 38 years. So I gave up the, the attempt at forcing a ballroom dancing lesson. So um, that, and I've, I've done a lot of cooking online. That was really nice. I went to some cookery classes online, which was really nice. So those have been the things I've been doing. And I've been reading to my granddaughter online through a very, very nice little app called Caribou that I downloaded. And we can read books and she's always choosing her book and it's really fun. So, and she sits on the other end and she can see the book I'm reading to her and I read from this end. So that's great fun. My favorite book. Uh, I think the book that I, the book that I'm reading now is um, Andrew Murray's biography of Churchill, which I, it's really very, very good. And I'm learning a lot about it. And I see what knocks it. I mean, I've always known that old um, Churchill had a few knocks in his political career. And I've had a couple of my own. So it's nice to see that you can come back from them. It's very nice to see that. And, uh, but I'm enjoying that book very much. But I think my favorite book is the, uh, the Origins of Political Order and Political Decay by Francis Fukuyama. It explains so much about the stages that people have to go through and history has to take you through before you get to these fundamental concepts of the rule of law, a culture of accountability and a capable state. And I've understood through that book why we are doing the near impossible in South Africa, shortcutting history by about 800 years. Traditional political economies and liberal political economies have not got a great fit. In traditional systems, the tribal chief owns everything and everything that anybody else is allowed to do is almost by grace and favor of the chief. Liberal democracy inverts that entirely and the leader is accountable to the people. Private ownership, not all land in the ownership of the chief who then allows you to work it for a particular amount of time and can kick you off if you displease him. The interface between the culture and the institutions of liberal democracy is as far away as you're going to get from traditional systems. And watching how that transition has happened worldwide in Francis Fukuyama's analysis of what gives rise to a sustainable political democracy and an economic, economically viable, viable democracy has been a very great insight to me. Obviously, China is an exception. I mean, China works as an as a open market economy, or not as an open market economy, as a market economy, a market economy, I should stress. But we've chosen to be a democracy before we become a viable economy. And so when you've done that, it's a very different trajectory from the one that China and other countries of the East have chosen. And reading that book, The Origins of Political Order and Political Decay, has been a very, very profound experience for me in my life. And then, how do we make these things um, attractive to younger people? Well, I think satire is really great. And I think uh, Britain has the best satire of all because of the sense of humor that is just wonderful. And so, you know, I think that Jonathan Pye is a really great liberal. I love, I love the way he, he sends up all the nonsense that passes for liberalism these days. And I think he defends a lot of the fundamentals that are at risk of being slaughtered in the new woke liberalism, such as free speech and freedom of ideas and association, which I'm very, very much for. And um, yeah, you get on there, you have these discussions, you, uh, 
you debate, you go in and fight, and you fight things like cancel culture all the way. You fight things like cancel culture all the way. Thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely fascinating to hear from you about an incredible range of topics, and we hope to be able to invite you to Cambridge one day. <laughs> that would be great. My, my husband's a, a, a graduate of Oxford, so I always said to him, if I could go to either of them, I'd definitely go to Cambridge. <laughs> Yes, a much better university. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> My niece was there. Very nice to speak to you. Go well. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.